Welcome to today's webinar, Ask a Recruiter Interviewing. We have a great panel of recruiters lined up for you today, as well as a great moderator, and I'm excited for today's presentation. But before I get started, we'd like to thank our members and donors of the Alumni Association for powering our alumni webinar series. To learn more about membership, you may go to umnalumni.org slash membership. All right. And today's webinar is also brought to you by our Maroon and Gold Network and our Minnesota Alumni Net uh, Market. Our, Minas our Maroon and Gold Network is a free online platform from the University of Minnesota Alumni Association for career-related advice, networking, and mentorship. Sign up today at maroonandgoldnetwork.umnalumni.org. And to learn more about our Minnesota Alumni Market, which is a first-of-its-kind online store, dedicated to supporting U of M alumni businesses and their products, you may learn more at mnalumnimarket.com. And I'll also share that information with you after today's webinar. All right. And to learn more about some upcoming webinars that you may be interested in today, we have a number of them listed here on your screen, including Coffee and Career Connections with a focus on business industry. And that will be a panel and networking event scheduled for November 17th. We also have a panel on becoming an entrepreneur on November 19th and an opportunity to discuss identity, particularly focused on LGBTQ in the workplace on December 10th. For a listing of all of these webinars and more, you may go to umnalumni.org slash virtual. All right. And if you're listening in um, today and you'd like to tune in by phone, you may dial 646-558-8658 and then dial the webinar ID when you're prompted, which is 958-0427-6989. And uh, we'll also have an opportunity for questions after today's panel um, discussion. And so you may drop your questions into our Q&A box and we'll do our very best to answer as many of those questions as possible towards the end of today's webinar. All right, and without further ado, we'll begin in, uh, with introductions of our of our moderator and our panelists and I'll turn it over to Chrissy, our moderator today. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chrissy Francis. I use she, her pronouns and I work as a career counselor in the College of Science and Engineering here at the U of M. Um, I've been at the university a few years in my current role, and I'm also an alum. I graduated from the College of Education and Human Development with my master's degree. So I'm happy to moderate our panel today. I think we've got quite a few great recruiters with us. Um, and I would just encourage you all to start thinking about questions that you might have for our panel. We'll go through a few questions, and then we'll turn it over to our audience so that you can get your questions answered too. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Erin to introduce herself, just share a little bit about your role, um, where you're working, and your connection with the U if you have one. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chrissy. Um, so I'm Erin. Uh, I am a U of M alum. So I graduated back in 2015 um, through CLA. I actually got a degree in psychology. I uh, worked in behavior therapy for a couple of years and was really rewarding, but I really burnt out. So I moved into an HR role um, and I fell in love with recruiting hundred percent. So I've been doing that ever since. Um, and I actually currently work at a company called Restaurant Technologies. Most people probably haven't heard of it. Uh, basically they deliver cooking oil to McDonald's and lots of other restaurants, but I work as a recruiter there uh, mainly for the operations role and some corporate and sales. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Great, thank you. Next up we have Tracy. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, my name is Tracy Gabralsic. I use she, her, and her pronouns. I am a recruiter with the city of Minneapolis. I have been in recruiting or HR as a whole for almost eight years, um, but I've been with the city for about a year and a half. Um, my background spans in a few different industries, including hospitality, supply chain logistics, um, nonprofit, hospitals, and health government. Um, my role with the city is I work with all 24 of our departments in regards to strategy and recruitment for all positions within the city. So that could be anything from IT to HR to public works, bridge workers and engineers, um, spans really the whole gamut of anything that we do to help the city run and help everybody who lives here. 
All right, thank you. Next, we have Alexa. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, like I said, my name is Alexa Johnson. I'm an account manager over at Catapult Network. Um, we are a small recruiting agency based here out of the Twin Cities and uh, several other states. Um, but we primarily work with recent college grads and helping them find entry level opportunities post college. Um, I've been in recruiting for about five years now, um, but my main role is to kind of help connect candidates to different companies across the area um, and really enjoy being able to kind of help people find their foot in the door opportunity and see them grow. Thank you. And our last panelist of the day is Anne. All right, well, hello everyone. I'm really um, thrilled to be here and be part of the conversation today. I am a graduate um, of the U of M with my undergrad degree from CLA. Um, it was actually in art. So I really never thought I would be in human resources and have a career um, now that I have, but it just goes to show, I guess, where um, ever you have a passion, you can um, find a home. So uh, that's what I do now. I'm also finishing up my MBA with um, Iowa State at the moment, but I am still a gopher at heart. And um, I'm currently a director at talent of talent acquisition and talent experience for Land Lakes. I've been there for about 20 years. And before that time, I really started my career in search firm experience and spent time with other organizations where I was focused on talent acquisition and have always had a passion for that and for um, just a general curiosity about people's jobs and their roles and how they can find new opportunities and really um, what an impact that has on their lives. So very passionate about this topic um, for today. All right, thank you all. So we're gonna move into some prepared questions. Um, don't feel like you have to answer all of the questions, um, but jump in where you see fit. So the first question I'd like to ask is, how has COVID-19 impacted the interview process or experience? And can you describe what this looks like at your respective companies? Erin, um, do you wanna start with this question? Sure, yeah. So for our company, the main kind of area that was impacted is how we're going about interviewing. We are still interviewing a lot of roles in person if they are out at a location where we want people to see our trucks if they're doing something with driving or they're going to be using our tools we still want them to come in but we're always doing a phone interview with the manager first for our corporate and sales roles that has gone completely virtual so now we're using all virtual online tools for interviewing uh, the candidates almost never meet face to face unless it's a very high level director role. And at that point they have to schedule at a very specific time to go into the office when no one else is going to be there. Uh, so learning skills around video interviewing right now, I think could be really helpful for a lot of people. It is a completely different experience than going in person. There's a lot of other things you have to think about your background, um, you know, where your eyes are looking, you wanna make sure you're looking at the center of the screen, those kinds of things. So um, I would say that, you know, any kind of webinars based on that might be really helpful for people right now. Thank you. Others feel free to jump in if you'd like. I can chime in. Um, I think very similar to what Erin is saying, you know, much of our process, really all of it for Land Lakes has gone virtual. Um, and certainly uh, the adjusting to that, uh, some recruiters were, uh, th that wasn't quite as big of a hurdle, but for hiring managers and others, that certainly has been a shift. So making sure that everybody feels comfortable. Um, so trust me, if you're feeling nervous about technology or that's a new space for you, I can assure you that usually that manager on the other end is also feeling like they're trying to navigate um, kind of new territory as well. Uh, but that's definitely been a big shift. And I don't know that that's going to entirely go back. And, you know, I think, wonder about that. And so I think, um, you know, as Aaron was saying, any training, getting a comfort level, knowing the technology um, is certainly something that may be here to stay to some degree as we think about interviewing in the future. So really worth um, paying attention to anything you can learn on that. Alexa or Tracy, do you have any perspective on this? We really are doing almost exactly the same as Aaron and Anne have said. We've had a very small number of positions that have been face-to-face -face, and in those situations, we have possibly um, lessened the number of panelists and increased the number of interviews if that's a situation we've had to do, if there need to be more people, but then also making sure that we have masks and hand sanitizer and disinfectant and everything in the room 
So anybody can feel comfortable to use it, you know, obviously disinfecting before and after, but then also letting people, you know, take, take it upon themselves to do it if they want to as well. Um, so that's been a big change, I think, for us. Um, but I'll, otherwise, most of the things have been virtual. We have moved um, quite a bit of our onboarding virtual as well. So new employee orientations and things like that have also shifted more towards a virtual setting. Um, so that was also kind of a big change to make sure that we had everything available online and so people could use there. Um, but I know in my um, experience using video, Skype, you know, five years ago, it's a very different ball game. And I think at least for myself, I'm thankful that we have more tools that I feel like are easier to use than there used to be when Skype was still fairly new. Um, so that's what I think kind of a help for anybody who has used it before that it's getting easier in some respects. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback, I mean, we're on the same page. Um, most of our teams doing virtual interviewing, um, virtual, um, you know, meet and greets or onboarding, like Tracy said, it's been pretty remote as well. Um, I think one area that's kind of impacted us is that we, you know, help place candidates in different companies. Um, so trying to adjust to their rules and kind of what they're doing with hiring or just interviewing, um, everybody's been a little bit different. We've seen some companies continue meet people on site. So just reminding everybody to wear masks and social distance and hand sanitized when they get the chance. Um, so that's just been another area is just reinforcing and just kind of reiterating safety precautions and making sure everybody's doing okay. But I would say for the most part, everything's been virtual. Um, and like what Anne said, we're all learning. And, you know, if you're having technical issues, I'm sure they've run into the same issue as well. I know I have. Um, so it's all a learning curve for everybody until we all get into the routine of continuing probably being remote as well. Yeah, so it sounds like a lot of similar themes, a lot more virtual interviews, certainly. Um, and I agree with the technology issues. We all have them. So if you can just kind of normalize it a little bit and realize the other person interviewing you is just another person trying to figure it out, that can take some of the pressure off, certainly. So that's kind of a nice segue into our next question of what would you recommend for some best practices for an effective video interview? What are some things you like to see or maybe even common pitfalls of things to avoid? And let's see, Tracy, do you wanna start this one off? Sure. Um, I would say, I think that we kind of covered a few things, you know, we, I think luckily since everybody's in kind of the same scenario with being working or working at home and being virtual that there's a little bit, like you said, normalization around um, distractions potentially happening and you, no matter what you try to do, you can't avoid everything going on at your home or even in the room you're in, you know, who knows, there could be a storm outside, you know, anything crazy can happen. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously trying to prepare your best, you know, making sure you're in a quiet area of your home or, you know, office, wherever you are, um, and doing your best to have, you know, I would say decent lighting as well, because I think it helps you being on the interviewer side as well. Um, but really, I think the biggest thing, like I said, not to just keep repeating myself, but just making sure that you try to prepare yourself to have at least distractions as possible. I think that would have, that helps everybody feel a little bit more comfortable when they're talking to other people virtually. So that's kind of my biggest piece, I would say. Can I go next? <laughs> um, one thing that I have been telling a lot of candidates or just job seekers in general is, you know, if you are doing a virtual interview um, and you were given, you know, the link to check out, I recommend checking it out usually the night before. Um, making sure it works, making sure your speaker works, your camera works, um, so you can try to get out any kinks. Um, you know, technology-wise, obviously, sometimes things change and it can't always, you know, be 100%, but I think, you know, testing it out first just helps you feel more prepared and kind of more relaxed of, okay, I know what I'm doing before I jump into the call the next day. Um, that's just something that I've, you know, kind of learned from, you know, my end, when trying to meet with a client, you know, just trying to test things out beforehand so it doesn't soak up any of that person's time trying to figure things out on my end. Um, so that's one thing I've really have been trying to tell people and kind of give them that tip that it's just a helpful and will go a long way. 
I, I can add just a little bit to that as well. And I think, you know, one of the things to keep in mind with um, video is I think obviously we're, we've more, we've adjusted to a more casual environment normally um, now being at home. And so um, just remember that you still want to make that first impression um, with that person um, via video. So if you would have normally put on a tie, if you were to go in in person or a sports jacket, then do that for the video. Show them that you're serious about making a good impression. And, um, you know, use that as a gauge on how you might have dressed if you would have come in maybe to that building in person and met with them. Um, so I, I think that that's important, you know, also be aware of your surroundings. So that's pretty um, obvious, but it, it really does matter to just kind of think about what are they going to see behind you <laughs> and, and not that that should be, um, you know, a focus of somebody interviewing you. But, um, you know, you don't want any distractions or things um, or, or, you know, or, or not have something neat or, you know, what have you um, that's that's behind you while you're while you're trying to, um, again, give off a good impression. So little things, but they can certainly go a long way. The other thing I think is it's very hard to kind of make eye contact over video, right? And and it's uh, it's easy, and I will do this, I'm sure, as we talk today, to you know look at um, maybe the screen where you can see yourself um, versus trying to, to look into the camera and um, try to make that eye contact connection with the person on the other side of the screen. So to the extent that you can practice that, a tip that I would suggest is you can record yourself on Zoom. So go out and um, practice with maybe a recording of yourself and then see how, play that back and use that to, to kind of practice and understand how you'll come across. I love that suggestion to practice. I had not thought of that, but I think that's an excellent tip to practice recording yourself and see how you sound and how you look. And then you kind of get that person's perspective, you know, of what they're seeing. And I mean, everybody had really good points. I agree with everything everyone said, just go into it, you know, make it as professional as you can, have a clean background, have a good, you know, interview outfit, however you would normally dress. Um, and then, you know, just, we are more understanding, you know, what Tracy said, we're a little bit more understanding too, that we're all at home, there's kids, there's dogs. So if you're putting forth that effort right away that, you know, you dressed nice, you have this clean background and then something does happen, a kid runs through, you know, you're, we all know that that's going on right now. It's not the end of the world. We know that you put your best foot forward. So yeah, I think everyone gave some really good advice here. Yeah, those are all really great tips. Thank you. So going beyond the virtual environment, how would you suggest candidates prepare for interviews in general? What types of things might they need to be doing ahead of time to feel confident and ready for their actual interview? And Alexa, will you start this one, please? Yeah, um, I mean, kind of going off of what Anne mentioned, um, previous question is one, you know, preparing yourself for the video call, making sure you're ready to go. Um, but on top of that, I personally like having your resume in front of you, um, even during a video call, just so you can visually see what they're looking at. Um, and you can kind of walk through your resume, you know, while it's in front of you. Um, since, you know, normally you would have that opportunity in person um, it's still good to have that right next to you as well. Um, I always encourage candidates to also research the company before you have that interview as well. Knowing who you're interviewing and what the position's about definitely goes a long way. Um, so you kind of know how to relate your transferable skills um, and, and past experiences to maybe the culture where if the company has core values listed on their website or even just the type of industry that you can connect with. Um, definitely doing that homework um, is helpful and can go a long way. Um, and like Anne said too, I mean, practicing definitely helps. So even maybe doing a test run interview with yourself or maybe with a roommate or family member um, can definitely get you more comfortable, especially if you're looking at a video interview um, for that interview. Um, you know, that can kind of get some of the nerves out if you've practiced and kind of gotten a sense of what to say or what to talk about with that individual that you're meeting with. One thing also that I've become a fan of more and more over the years is um, along the same things as Alexa was saying with researching the company, um, using really all your tools for that. I really enjoy looking at LinkedIn company pages and just kind of checking out the lay of the land as far as 
you know, what employees are listed as working on there. And especially with companies that have multiple locations, I always think it's kind of cool to maybe get a general idea of who might be located where um, or what types of functions are in each office, if that's something that differs. So I think that that helps as well with the research. Um, but then one thing too that I always like to do for myself and that I always share with everybody is writing down a lot of questions. Like even if it's something super simple that's in the job posting or you maybe learned on a phone interview, something that even if it's something you may want to just confirm, like a location or dress code or you know anything, even if you think it might be simple and um, easy, um, write it down. And if they answer it, you can cross it off. And I've been in scenarios before where They've answered every single one of my questions, and I think that it's okay to remember that you don't have to feel pressured to have a bunch of questions to ask, but if you're prepared with some going into it, I feel like it makes yourself and sometimes the interviewer more comfortable knowing that you had ideas of things, um, and that really you got the information you needed from them from the conversation. Um, so those are two things that I would add. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think for me as a recruiter, when somebody has questions, it shows interest and that's really important. Um, a lot of applicants, I don't think, realize that, but somebody who is very, seems very interested in a position is gonna be a little bit higher up on the totem pole than somebody who does, it seems a little bit more indifferent. Um, so if you have questions prepared, it just shows that you're interested in the role, you want to learn more. Uh, it's very, very helpful for recruiters to see that. And then, you know, like Tracy mentioned, if you're crossing off questions, that's fine. It shows that you had them prepared and that we're answering them for you. But just knowing that, you know, you came prepared and you wanted to know more that that's big. I would just add to that on the, you know, having questions, I think is super important and can't overemphasize um, taking some time to research the organization, understand the industry, who their customers might be. There's so much information available online that there's almost not an excuse to not, um, you know, do some research. And so that could be a flag, you know, if, if someone doesn't bother to, to kind of take that effort. Um, the questions, I think that that is so right on um, that oftentimes I've been sometimes disappointed if somebody didn't have a question. And they might have written me off because I was the HR person or the recruiter, and maybe they saved all their really technical questions for the hiring manager. But, you know, think about everybody on the interview panel and think about what questions you might have for each of them. Um, if there's a, even just one question um, that you would ask everybody, maybe about their development experience at the company or you know something personal for them. I think that that uh, certainly having being prepared that way goes a long way. The other thing I would say, and maybe this is back to kind of being virtual, be careful with your answers that you aren't too scripted or referring to a script. I have sometimes noticed that people on screen feel more comfortable to kind of read to, you know, their answers. Maybe they've got them written next to them. And so I would just say, you know, you definitely want to be prepared for sure, have your answers, you know, thought out, but um, keep that natural and, um, you know, try to avoid the temptation of kind of reading um, off of a script next to you just because you maybe have the benefit of being virtual right now. Um, so I think that that would just be another um, ad. It's a good point, Anne. You don't want to sound scripted in your interviews <laughs> for sure. And I love that all of you mentioned having good questions prepared. I think another benefit for you as a job seeker is that you get to really learn if that position is a good fit for you and if you want to work at that company. And that's another good reason why you want to have a lot of questions prepared so that you can actually assess your fit. Um, I know times are a little different right now, so you might feel like you don't have very many options and you must accept a position, but I still don't believe that's true. I do think there are plenty of companies that are hiring and you do have say in where you choose to work and where you don't. So Questions, questions can definitely help you assess that. All right. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention as well, make sure you know how to talk about yourself. If it's been a long time since you've interviewed, it might feel a little weird to be able to talk about your skills and your strengths and why you would be a good candidate. But if you can't convey that confidently, the employer is not going to believe it either. So just make sure that you've practiced and you know how to talk about yourself well. All right, our next question, um, and maybe you can start us off with this one. What are some things you think you should avoid during the interviews in addition to being rehearsed and scripted? <laughs> um, 
You know, one thing I, I think I would just caution is uh, sometimes we have bad experiences and maybe we're leaving a current role or an organization or maybe a manager because it's not a good situation for us. And that's entirely understandable. But I, I think that you, you certainly want to convey a positive energy when you're interviewing and you um, it would be better for you, I think, to frame up um, a, a, a positive way to position maybe some of your challenges or things you don't you don't want to come across and I would just caution anyone of, of you know disparaging a, a current employer or being really negative um, it's it's a little bit hard for that interviewer to interpret that and so I, I think I would just be careful about you know maybe coming across really negative um, so I think that that would be one thing to avoid um, you know, the other, I, I really, I kind of, I guess I was thinking about script, you know, reading the script and some other things. So I think that's the one thing that comes to mind to me and I'll pass it along to someone else for more ideas. I feel like um, I shouldn't have to say this one, but I will because I've run into it a lot. Um, and it's not just with my ops roles, blue collar. I've run into it with people who come out, you know, BA, in business, so you know, master's degrees, just don't get too casual, even if you're having a really good conversation with the person and you're getting along and you feel comfortable, um, still keep it professional. I've had multiple instances of people just casually swearing during interviews, which I would hope most of us would know not to do, but unfortunately some people don't. Um, so definitely something to avoid. Um, and then also there's always a question um, on you know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, I think that when you talk about your weaknesses, there's a way that you can frame them that don't put you in a bad light and you don't want to lie during an interview ever, but there's a, it's important to think about how you're answering questions and kind of avoid putting yourself in a bad light, even if you are talking about your weaknesses, you know, be honest and um, kind of turn it into a strength if you can. Or show how you're working on it or managing it. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yep. Aaron, you took my idea. I was going to talk about the casual side of things. It's definitely hard to not because you don't see them and you just kind of, you're in your own home. So it may seem like it's more casual, especially if the lower half of your body is in sweats. Um, but I definitely want to take it seriously because, you know, you're definitely using their time just as much as they're using yours. Um, so they want to get as much out of it. Um, and I think another thing on top of that is, you know, with video interviewing, because you don't have to go anywhere, it's still very important to be on time for joining that call um, and that you're not, you know, five minutes late. Or if you're having any sort of technical issues, making sure you have that contact information right next to you so you can call them right away and keep them in the loop of what you're experiencing on your end. Um, you know, being on time for things is definitely very important in and out of the office. Um, so that's something I really try to, you know, say not to do or avoid during interviews. You know, and I'm coming up with not much else to add. Everybody kind of took some of the main ones that I usually point out. So I won't, I won't go on with repeating anything. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. So now is, I was going to say the fun part, but the second fun part, because this was fun too. <laughs> uh, we want to hear from all of you. So what specific questions do you have about interviewing? Um, feel free to use that Q&A box, type in your question, and we will be looking at those questions to review them and um, hopefully get some of your individual questions answered today too. Great. Thank you, Christy. And I'll help you manage some of the questions here and feel them your way as we're waiting for questions to come in. And looks like, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I'm there's lots of questions starting to come in, so I'm just starting to read them all. Um, wow, they're all coming in. <laughs> okay, let's start with the top. So dealing with distractions. So say a dog's barking. How should somebody go about dealing with that distraction? Um, you know, does it look poorly? Um, what is your take on that sort of those sort of distractions that are starting to happen now that we're in this virtual space and we're kind of working from our home environments? One thing I've seen a couple times um, 
and I doesn't necessarily solve the problem or really solve it for you necessarily. But I think that as a common courtesy, it might be always nice that, you know, if you have a kiddo running around or if you have a dog or a cat or what have you, you know, just say right up front, like, Hey, I apologize. You know, I have such and such going on. Like I have, you know, closed the door or whatever, but just in case they come in, I apologize in advance or just heads up. Um, that, like I said, that doesn't solve it, but I think it goes a long way to, you know, let people know that you have a situation potentially um, and just kind of get it out there. I think that that never hurts. Great. Yeah, I think it's a matter of how you handle it to finesse and be able to handle things under pressure with some distractions and kind of demonstrating um, that, you know, you're, you're doing your, your best <laughs> in some ways. I see a couple of questions we might be able yeah. to find. Um, one of the questions is if you, the interviewer didn't give you an email and they forgot to ask, what do they do? I'm imagining maybe that was a connection made at a career fair or an in-person or virtual <laughs> event. Um, and then another part of that question would be, how can you get the names of all the people interviewing you in advance? So maybe how to do some of that research to figure out how to get connected to the people that are interviewing you. Any ideas on that? Well, I think one way it could be to reach out via LinkedIn. Um, well, I suppose that would be hard to do if you don't know their name, right? So that does pose a challenge now that I'm saying that out loud. Um, but I, you know, if there's anyone else who may have been at a particular event with you um, that uh, might have grabbed a card or something, I mean, certainly be aware, um, you know, connect with them so that you can get that information. And so often, in most career um uh, sites have, um, you know, 1-800 numbers or places that you can go to try to get an answer. Somebody at the organization um, may be able to help direct you to the right place. So it, I think that it would be resourceful um, to be able to check that out on the career page and see how you might be able to find the recruiting department or somebody that could connect you in. Um, so that would be one, one thing to try. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that to the question about ahead of time, um, you know, I know a lot of organizations have um, done a lot of more email versus phone communication lately. So I would say, and I've done this myself, is if you're emailing with a certain individual that's setting up an interview, say, or what, for corresponding with you with your application, um, don't be afraid to ask them. And if they don't know, they'll tell you. I've been in a scenario before where we were still shoring up who was going to be on the interview panel. So I wasn't able to say exactly, but if they know, ask ahead of time, they'll tell you if they have the information um, or most people will. So I would say definitely encourage to ask if you're corresponding or like Ann said, um, if there is an HR email or phone number, um, you know, utilize that. And there should be somebody that will be able to get back to you with more info um, if they're able to get it. It looks like there's some questions here around follow up and timing of that and method of follow up. So, email follow up versus a thank you letter, and how soon should someone follow up? Um, is 72 hours too late? Uh, what are some expectations around follow up? Well, I think with COVID, I would imagine most people are from home. <laughs> so probably email um, is probably the best option. And obviously you gals can chime in with a different opinion. Uh, but personally, I think email is, you know, it's going to get to them. You know, you have their email address, you can send it directly to them. Um, it's just, I think, a lot easier to control versus sending out a letter and hoping it gets to them. Um, plus, you never know if it's delayed or if it gets lost, um, at least that way they get it in some form um, that way. Um, I personally like sending out um, thank you emails typically within the first, I would say 24, 30 hours of the interview. Um, it's more so just so you don't forget if you wait too long. Um, again, kind of a personal opinion on my end, but you know, I think it's, it always looks good when it's kind of fresh right afterwards. Um, and you can kind of, you know, point out a couple pieces uh, that you talked about that you really liked and how you could match well with the position or the team. Um, so that's something that we've kind of talked about with our candidates when it comes down to following up afterwards. Yeah, I think, I think email is usually the best. I think also if you're communicating with them, 
previously in setting up your phone interview via email, it's best to thank them by email. If you're texting them or if they've been with you over the phone, you know, maybe you might go about that a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I would just go with whatever method you've been communicating with them on and email is always like Alexa said, email is always, you know, it's going to get there. So that's probably the safest method. <laughs> I think is a, the, a part of the question about follow-up. Um, one thing I'd suggest is if you are working with a recruiter, they definitely should be able to help you in kind of understanding what that time frame looks like. But if you maybe don't have that person who's helping um, mediate that, certainly um, asking the hiring manager, you know, uh, as you're wrapping up your interview, uh, what kind of time frame they're on and and uh, and how soon they might look to make a decision or what next steps might be involved is entirely appropriate um, to understand uh, maybe how far along they are in their process or what they can share with you about that. And I think that, that that's, that's appropriate and professional um, to ask and then be able to step back and kind of let them stick to their time frame and process. But hopefully if there's a good recruiter involved who can help you out as well, they will certainly be happy to keep you posted on timelines. They're usually motivated also to make sure that you're in the loop and, and um, you know, want you to be successful, so. All right. Can you share what you would be looking for in the tell me about yourself question? That's usually the very first question. So it's good to do it well. So if I have to be honest, I am not a fan of the vagueness of that question. Um, that's just speaking totally for myself. Um, I personally in my recruiting position have always tried to tailor that question so it is more specific so you're not left out in the wind wondering what I'm supposed to say. Um, so I think a lot of times if that is how the question is asked, mostly what they're looking for is I would kind of approach it as, you know, how does your ex either reviewing your experience and or how does your past experience fit with this position? or, you know, what your passions are in your professional experience. Um, you know, don't go into personal, you know, I'm married, have kids, et cetera, et cetera, because those are always like, no, no questions. Um, so keep it um, professional and in regards, and keep your answers in regards to the position you're discussing. Um, and if there's some, still some weirdness, I would say just ask for clarification. If you want to know more of you know, what they're looking for in information, um, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. Any other ideas on that question? I agree with everything Tracy said. It, that is a tough question. And I also personally don't like to ask that. I usually will ask more specifically, tell me about your work history or tell me about your education. Um, but like Tracy said, I would just stick to that. If they're asking, just tell me about yourself, just talk about you know, your education level, a little bit about kind of where you've been professionally, just stick to the pieces that are most relevant to the job. Uh, you're applying for and then you know talk about your most recent job and why you're interested in this company um, you can I guess you can kind of if it's really vague you can kind of make it your own so you know just talk about everything that you feel is relevant to that position and just put yourself in a really good light sometimes I also like thinking about past present and future that's kind of a nice way to sum up that question of a little bit about your history what you're currently doing now and then the future is usually, why are you applying for this position and why are you interested in it? Great, it looks like there's a question here. What is a good number of range of questions to ask during an interview? So how many questions is too many? How, much, how many questions are just right? What are your thoughts there? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say, I don't know if there's ever going to be a point where there's too many questions per se. There are definitely are candidates that ask a lot of questions that to me seem repetitive sometimes or almost start to get a little bit irrelevant. And I'm not sure if they're just asking questions to ask questions or if they just don't understand the position very well. Um, but if you have, you know, five, six, seven questions, that's not too many. Even if you have, I'd say even if you have 10 and they're all really good questions, I'm not going to knock you for asking 10 questions that are really good. It's just more stick to questions that actually matter, things you actually want to know, things we haven't already discussed during the process, uh, things that, you know, you actually care about in the job, you know, benefits or 
just anything that's relevant. Stay away from questions. Just don't just ask questions, ask questions, I guess. Have good questions prepared, but ask good questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think the quality of your questions are important, and that, that can make an impression that sets you apart, actually. A few really quality questions um, that you've been thoughtful about um, can go a lot further than, you know, a whole list of small questions that might actually make you look like you weren't really prepared, because now you're coming in and you still have a ton of questions. So, um, you know, try to find the right balance for that with, uh, with um, some thoughtful questions. And if you can get that list or understand who you you'll be talking to um, and have some understanding of their title or their role, um, you can maybe better gear a question towards that person a little bit um, that, that might be different from others. But I, I, I would be, yeah, just careful about that and um, not have a whole laundry list. Usually in interviews, you know, the questions are coming at you and that interviewer might just save a few minutes at the end of the interview time for you to ask some questions. So you also wanna be cognizant of time. Mm -hmm. um, so if you continue to keep that interviewer kind of on the line and you're going way over that time, um, that might be stressful for them um, if they need to move on or there's you know, a, a conflict now that, they're, that you know, you're going over um, with a number of questions. So whatever amount you have, be aware of the time you have left to ask those and make sure they're quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of points back to that being prepared question of, you know, feel free to write them down beforehand. Um, so you can kind of visually see what style questions you have, maybe your top five questions that you want to, you know, make a point to ask or go through versus all 10. Um, that could be a really great way to kind of just keep yourself organized and also making sure that you are asking well thought out questions. Um, but still getting what you're looking for out of that interview as well. Um, so writing that down and maybe just doing a little bit of research on good questions to ask could be helpful. Great, thank you. If a candidate finds out after their interview that they didn't get the position, is it okay for them to ask for feedback? I think it's okay, <laughs> um, but my, you know, situations is a little bit different um, since, again, we work with clients and candidates, um, so we kind of have this middle ground of being a communicator between both parties. Um, I, I personally appreciate when clients give me feedback so I can give feedback to candidates. I think it doesn't hurt to ask um, just to see if you can get anything out of it to kind of better yourself moving forward. Um, I don't know if you guys have any opinion on that, but I think it's at least okay to ask um, as a follow-up. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to cut over okay, to, to just say um, that I agree. And, and it's, it's, perfectly fine to ask the question. And it shows that you're really trying to improve and you wanna know, you know if there's anything you can do for future. And I think that's very um, fair and valid. Um, but be prepared that especially if it is an internal you know, recruiter representing an organization, they may not be able to give you a lot of information. And you may get kind of a standard answer that we've just found maybe a, a, a candidate who is a better match for the role, you know, whatever that means. And, and they may have kind of a more standard answer. So don't be thrown by that and just take it for what it's worth. Um, you may or may not get that kind of an answer that gives you a lot of information, but it's entirely okay to ask the question. Here's another question here. At what point is it appropriate to ask about salary and benefits? I would say benefits, it's appropriate to ask right away. Um, at least for me, I, I talk about it in the first conversation I have with the applicant. Uh, for salary, I think that's kind of a tricky one. It really depends on the role and the company and the person. But I mean, general rule, I would wait to talk about salary until you're getting closer to the end of the inner, you know, line of interviews and just kind of know um, compensation rates in the area, um, kind of have an idea of what you think you, you know, this position should be paying um, so that when they, you know, they do bring up salary, you can kind of gauge whether or not, you know, you think that that is, that's appropriate compared to, you know, what other jobs might be offering in the area. Um, but yeah, salary, it's tricky for 
for me personally, for my hourly positions, I, as the recruiter, bring it up right away in the first interview because I want to know that that's working for the person when we're moving forward. Um, but if I'm not bringing it up, I don't know, a lot of candidates will ask. I'm not thrown by it, but those are the kinds of roles that I'm recruiting for. Um, if somebody asked, you know, for a corporate position, it might be a little bit kind of, you know, why are you asking that right away? Do you really want this job? Are you just, you know, worried about money? So if anyone else has opinions on that, I'd love to hear it because I, for my role, it's a little bit different, but I'm kind of torn on that myself. I think I'm pretty similar to you, Erin, where um, if it's brought up right away, I don't think there's anything wrong with continuing the conversation or even, you know, as the person being interviewed, asking additional questions about it. Um, but I do think I've kind of fallen the same camp as you with, if it doesn't get brought up, I usually wait until the end because typically, you know, there can be, you know, a negotiation process or they want to talk with you about, you know, maybe the hiring manager or who would be your manager is going to be the last person you meet. And they might want to go over that with you yourself. I've been in situations like that. Um, so I think it's kind of like reading the room that maybe not doesn't answer the question very well, but um, just kind of gauge how things are going or how the conversation is. Because um, yeah, there can be scenarios where it might be looked upon negatively to ask so in, you know incessantly right away. Um, the other thing that I can think of is you know if you maybe are interviewing with three different companies and are trying to you know maybe you're further along in the process with one of them than you are with somebody else. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with maybe you know telling them you know hey I've been interviewing with other companies or, you know, they're preparing an offer for me. I just want to have this discussion because I'm really interested in your company. Um, and I just want to, you know, have all of my information, something along those lines. That's a whole nother different scenario, but something else that I would throw out there is something that's another approach that you can keep in the back of your mind as well. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I, I know that we have recruiters that might ask, you know, up, more upfront in the process and only because they just want to be careful about, um, you know, making sure it's good use of someone's time to go further into the process if those things match up or not. And I think if you are asking that question in maybe a phone screen or something early, you know, at an earlier stage with somebody, be prepared that they might turn that back on you to say, what are you targeting for yourself? And that can really stump people if they weren't ready to answer that question. So I would just say, you know, if you're going to ask the question, be prepared to say if you're targeting a certain range, or maybe my current job is at X, so I really wouldn't want to go below that or you know have some kind of thought put to how you might answer that question early on if you're going to bring up the salary topic um, because that might come back to you and recruiters you generally you know may want to really know that and understand kind of you know what you're what you are looking for for yourself um, and might have a range in mind that they can share with you it depends um, about the role but that that just might be something to prepare for if you're going to bring up the salary question a good segue into another question of how to do a salary negotiation tips for that conversation and i'll preface it that you should negotiate after you have the offer so don't do it in the interview process one thing that i always tell everybody when you're attempting or wanting to negotiate salary is i don't want to say don't make it about yourself because obviously pay is about yourself but um, try to approach it as professionally as possible. Um, I've had people who lay it out in a very personal manner with kind of the, do you know what bills I have conversation? And that can hit a little bit wrong, I guess you could say. But, you know, if you do feel like you, you know, your experience and everything warrants more money, I think that it's fully okay to bring that, you know, to the hiring manager saying, you know, hey, I do have... X amount of experience in this area that you had as a requirement in the position, um, you know, and doing some research, um, this is what I see that the area is paying or what the city is paying type of a thing or the location you're in, sorry. Um, but I would say do your, kind of do your research and be prepared to back up what you're asking for. I think that's super important and not just um, going about it in a potentially unprofessional manner. Um, so that's kind of my two cents of what I would say with that. It looks like I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, looks like there's a question about how do we answer, how do you, 
I guess some tips for answering why this position and, and or why this company, what are some tips there for doing your research or answering this question? Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you all. The question uh, being why you're interested in the company, that's the question, correct? Yes, the position or the company. Okay, um, I think that, well, first of all, we've all said, you know, doing your research. So, Verm, I mean, I can use myself as an example uh, with the current company when I got this role as a recruiter here. Um, I wasn't super passionate about cooking oil, I'm gonna be 100% honest. Uh, so I, beyond that, I did research. Um, you know, I looked at reviews, um, other employees doing reviews on the company. I looked at the LinkedIn page, uh, did some more research, not just on what they did, but kind of more on trying to dig into the culture. And that's really hard to do until you get into a place and interview, uh, but you can kind of glean the surface. So I more talked about that. I talked about, um, you know, the employees, uh, previous employees submitted these great reviews. It just seems like, you know, everybody's really happy to work here. They actually won a best places to work award. So I talked about that, um, those kinds of things. And I said, that's why I'm really interested in this position because I love recruiting and this company just seems so great. Um, so I think that's a good way to go about it if it's like, not something you're actually interested in. But I mean, it, it could be some, I mean, the, the company I worked at before this one, it was a social work company. And I was able to say, you know, I'm really, I love really passionate about psychology and social work. I just want to work in HR now. Um, so you can kind of go about it however, you know, best fits for you. But there's a couple ways I think that you can go about that question. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to that too, I mean, when looking at applying for the role, I mean, think about what was it that first interested you about this position? Um, and I think using that as an answer to help, especially for the position question, like why are you interested in this role? Um, I mean, what really caught your attention? You know, what did you like about it? You know, even look at your past experiences. Um, you know, I really felt like my past job and doing this, this, this really related well to the responsibilities of this position. And I'm really interested to further my experience in that area. Um, you know, kind of relating that to yourself is definitely very helpful. And I think it paints a good picture for the interviewer to get a good sense of who you are and kind of what you're looking to get out of this opportunity as well. All right, another question. What are your thoughts on reapplying for a position that you've interviewed for a few years ago and it didn't go very well? Um, and I also hear a lot of questions from current students wondering, can they apply for multiple positions within the same company? So those kind of go together, I think. I will say, yes, you can apply to multiple positions at the same company, uh, but make sure they are somewhat relevant to each other in some way. Uh, if you're applying to, I'm just going to use I don't know, I'm going to use it, like a finance role and then a driver, like those don't really make sense. It's just kind of, it seems like you maybe just want a job or you don't understand what either position is. But if you're applying for a finance role and maybe like an admin I, and you're just out of college, I might think, oh yeah, they're looking for, you know, they're looking to get their feet wet. They have this business degree. Maybe they have some interest in finance, but also looking to get in the door. I think that that makes sense. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's, I, I'm not opposed to multiple people or people applying to multiple jobs, as long as it seems to make sense. If they're applying to random jobs and it doesn't make sense, I we kind of just go, oh, maybe we'll just talk to these other candidates first because this, this person doesn't seem to know what they want. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing, Erin. I think just being strategic with what it is because you might have experience in multiple areas and then that's fine if it's you know reflected in your resume and it kind of makes sense. Um, but if you're just applying to apply, um, you know, I've seen you can, you probably don't want to apply for a vice president or director position and then an entry level position and just kind of hope for the best. Um, so yeah, be strategic about what you're applying for, I think. And then if there's more than one position you're applying for and it makes sense, you know, more power to you. Um, and then to the other question about applying for a job, I think it was Chrissy was it applying for a job that you had interviewed for before. Yeah, so if, if they could reapply for the same position that they'd interviewed for and it didn't go well a couple of years prior. Yeah, I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, if you did ask, like we were talking about earlier, if you asked a question about feedback and somebody gave that to you, you know, obviously take that super to heart and make sure that you can um, 
do better in those areas maybe, or present yourself better, answer questions better. Um, if you didn't get feedback, I would just take maybe some extra time to repair or prepare, not repair, sorry. And just think, you know, think about where maybe you have advanced since the time that you interviewed. Like, have you done anything different? What projects have you taken on? Have you been promoted? You know, all that kind of fun stuff and make sure that you can um, talk about that as well and maybe show how you maybe, you know, in this case might be a better fit now than you were then and why they should um, think about talking to you or considering you for the position. Um, and there might be some times where if it's the same hiring manager, they might be like, hey, I remember talking to you or, you know, something like that and bringing it up. Um, but I would say don't feel like you have to explain anything or expect that they're going to necessarily give you answers on why you didn't get it. But like I said, just make sure I think the most important thing is just kind of thinking about where you come or the things that you've worked on that you can elevate yourself with. Yeah, I think coming across always is somebody who has some self-awareness. You know, you've reflected, you've learned some things, you've got new experiences that you can bring to the table and being able to explain those. Tracy, absolutely, I agree wholeheartedly that that's a, a good way to approach it. I think that that's everyone who answered that question. So thank you so much, Chrissy, for your wonderful moderation today. And thank you each to Aaron, Alexa, Tracy, and Ann for your time and taking your, some time out of your busy days to be here with us and our audience today. Um, I will be sending out the recording of today's webinar to everyone, everyone within about two to three business days, as well as a survey. And so for that survey, I like for everyone to provide feedback on today's webinar, but it's also an opportunity to provide ideas for future topics that you would like to see the University of Minnesota Alumni Association host. So Phil, please do fill out that survey when you do receive it. And so, yes, thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to um, your participation in future webinars. So thank you all and have a great, wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.